Welcome to a single serving podcast. I'm your host, Shaney Silver, and I want to change the narrative around being single because so far it's had pretty bad PR. What if we stopped seeing single life as wrong and stopped trying so hard to fix it by finding partnership at any cost? Relationships are amazing and we deserve to have them. We just don't deserve to be miserable in the meantime. If you're ready to stop hating single life and to recognize that loving single life doesn't mean you'll be single forever, keep listening. This podcast publishes new episodes every Monday. You can find one episode per month on all your favorite free access platforms. All other weekly episodes are accessible by becoming a patron of this podcast on Patreon. You'll find the link in the show notes for this episode. By becoming a patron, you'll also get access to the Facebook group for this podcast, a supportive community space for celebrating single life, not just for dealing with it. There's so much joy, freedom, and potential in being single. My fear is that if we only ever see our singlehood as something that's wrong with us, something that has to be fixed as soon as possible by finding a partner, we'll miss out on a really important time in our lives, and we might even settle for less than what we really want. If you're sick of the shame of being single and sick of feeling helpless and unable to feel better, this is your podcast, and I'm so glad you're here. Hello and welcome to a single serving podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm your host, who has for some reason elected to talk like a flight attendant. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to finally share this episode with you. Uh, For the last month or so, I lost track of how many of you asked me to speak with Nancy Jo Sales. And um, what you didn't know was that I already had. So I'm so excited to finally share this interview with you. Nancy Jo Sales is a New York Times bestselling author. You may have already read The Bling Ring. She wrote that. And she has a new book coming out. Well, it is out now. You can buy it right now. And you should. It's called Nothing Personal, My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno. Um, She's one of us. Nancy Jo Sales is one of us. And she was such a joy and a pleasure to talk to. I had an absolute blast chatting with her, and I know you're going to really enjoy this discussion. Um, You've heard her on the Everything is Fine podcast. You've heard her on so many podcasts recently, and you've been sending them all to me. (laughs) And I've just wanted to say, guys, she's going to be on. Don't worry. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, So here it is. And I can't wait to share it with you. Before I do that, though, I want to talk to everybody who is not yet a Patreon patron about all of the May podcast episodes that are waiting for you over on Patreon, because we had a great month. We started things off with Sarah K. Runnels, who you might know better as Oh My God SKR on Instagram and Twitter. She's one of the funniest writers I have ever spoken to in my life. She cracks me up daily. We had an absolute blast chatting with each other. So if you follow her on Instagram or Twitter or both, you will really enjoy this episode. After that, I spoke to Melanie Notkin, who you might also know as the Savvy Auntie. We talk about all things auntiehood, whether you are an aunt by blood, by choice, Melanie has so many really, really important pieces of advice for being an aunt. And we also got into like the, not only the joy of being an aunt, but the value in it for both the aunties themselves and the kids that they're aunts for. Um, It was a wonderful episode. I've wanted to dedicate an episode to auntiehood for so long, and I'm really glad that Melanie joined me to make that happen. It's one of the most delightful episodes I've ever recorded. So I really hope that you'll give it a listen. And then the third episode in May is a solo episode. So it's just me. And I spent the entire time answering questions that came in from Patreon patrons. There is one that has been standing out with this audience the most. And that was a woman who wrote in to me about a scenario that I think many of us in the single space are familiar with. And that is when you go out on a date with someone and they're perfectly nice and perfectly respectful, but you just don't feel anything for them. A lot of guilt can come up in that scenario, because we've been so groomed and often pressured as singles to treat every single opportunity like it's the last one that's coming along, or like if we happen to have one that isn't an asshole, we should be so grateful for that. Um, But we're allowed to simply not have feelings for people too. We're allowed to not like people, even if they're nice, even if they're respectful. There is nothing wrong with not liking someone. And by the way, being nice and being respectful, that's not making someone a catch. That's the baseline. Everybody should be that. Everyone. And uh, this person was experiencing some shame and some guilt because her friends and family were were telling her things like, you only like jerks and you're self-sabotaging by not liking this guy. And the whole time she's just like, I just don't feel anything for him. I just don't. 
And she listened to her friends and family. She went on a second date and she still did not feel anything for this person. And it had made her doubt her own feelings and her own intuition. And if you have ever doubted your own feelings or intuition, you will resonate with this episode so much. I had so much to say in response to this question. It was an incredibly emotional episode for me to record because I felt this very, very deeply. Obviously, it's going to be linked in the show notes. And then I'm also going to link you to an essay that I wrote that corresponds with this episode, because sometimes when I record these, and it's a really emotional moment, I find that um, taking some time and writing gives me a little bit more clarity, and it helps me speak from a less emotional place in a more like calculated writer brain space. So I like to do both. I like to record the episode and give you just sort of all of my like thoughts and emotions and rawness about the situation, because I think that's really valid and important. And it, it makes me feel less alone. And I hope it makes you feel less alone, too. But then I do like to sort of turn on the lawyer brain that I have a little bit when I write and make some arguments for why this is all horseshit, and we don't have to put up with it. So I'll link to everything in the show notes. And you can check it out. If you're not yet a Patreon patron, you can sign up for my Patreon and you can listen to this podcast once a week. I publish it every Monday. It is the joy of my life, and I hope you join us over there. It's $5 a month to get access to all podcast episodes, and you also get access to the Facebook community for this podcast, which is a really wonderful, supportive, joyous space where we you know, interact with each other and celebrate each other and talk about real shit, and it's, it's just a great space. And I know that Facebook groups aren't always so positive and um, uplifting, but this one is, and I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of everyone who's in it, and I hope you will join us. That will be linked below. If you are looking for some free ways to support this podcast, you can do things like leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also send it to friends. That's a huge, easy, and free way to support my work in this space. And I hope that you do it if you know a friend who could benefit from this, or if you find yourself sort of struggling to tell your partnered friends or partnered family how you are reframing singlehood for yourself, you can always send them an episode of this podcast. And I hope that that helps. Thank you so much for all of your support, especially Patreon patrons. You guys are the reason this podcast exists. I love you so much. Thank you for supporting the work that I do. And thank you for being such incredible members of this community. I really appreciate you. What do I want to talk to you about now? Um, I'm moving to New Orleans in a month. In a month, I'm moving. In a month. Um, little bit of anxiety around it, just because it's a big deal taking everything you own from one place and getting it to a new place and getting yourself to a new place and getting a lease in a new place. All these things add up to a bit of anxiety that I have been experiencing lately. Even though I've already moved across the country four times, the fifth time is still a doozy. But hopefully I am putting as much in place as possible to make it the easiest move I've had yet. I hope to be able to report back and tell you that indeed it was smooth as possible. Um, I'm a big advanced planner, so I've already started packing some things and I'm trying to stay as organized as possible and we will cross our fingers and see how it goes. Something else that's coming along with this move that I hadn't thought about until very recently. There's a little treat coming up for all of you listeners and that is the reemergence of my Southern accent. That's going to happen. Just letting you know in advance. Um, I read somewhere that accents are more about what you hear and less about what you say. And having been born and raised in Texas, I do have a Texas accent. It doesn't come out all the time because I've been away for a very long time. And so now moving back to the South, I have a feeling that accent is going to bubble to the surface and it will likely come through a microphone. I hope you all enjoy. What else do I want to talk to you about? I'm gonna, you know what? I'm just going to play the episode with Nancy because it's so good and it's so important. I really want you to hear from her and I really want you to buy and read her book. It is linked in the show notes, of course. One thing I do need to point out, there is a content warning at the very beginning of this episode during Nancy's introduction. You will hear a brief mention of rape and sexual assault. And if you would rather skip over the part where Nancy is introducing herself, you can choose to skip over that. Just want to let you guys know about that in advance. So for now, what I'm going to do is share an episode that so many of you have wanted. I'm so happy to be able to give this to you. I want to say a huge thank you to Nancy for joining me. She's promoting her book right now. I know she has a very busy schedule, but I'm so glad that she took the time to chat with me and to talk to all of you. And I hope you enjoy. You guys, I don't really know how to express my level of excitement right now, but I'm talking to Nancy Jo Sales, and by the end of this, you will get why I'm freaking out. Welcome, Nancy Jo, to the podcast. Thank you. Hi. 
How are you? I'm great. Well, I mean, great. These are tumultuous times where there's a lot of high emotion and and things to be very concerned about. But me personally, I'm I'm pretty lucky and I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? I'm I'm exactly the same way that you are. I there are a lot of really strong highs and lows and I think the thing that keeps me in the middle is working. As long as I have work and I'm busying myself, I'm generally okay. Um, but yeah, it is, there's so much going on and there's so much been going on. Like there's, it's a, a really long period of stress and just newness. A yeah. really long period of stress and everything being new and everything changing and being volatile. But uh, in general, I find that work is, uh, work is keeping me together. Stress and having, for so many people who are single... Um, like I am having to deal with it alone, you know, and, and um, having to find support. And that's been hard too. And that's another reason I'm so excited to be on your podcast because it's fantastic. And I love it. And I love your work. And oh, thank you and so I, much. and I, I, I told you that when I read it, I just feel like sending, I'm sending you lots of clapping emojis through the airwaves because it's always so in, in line in keeping with what I'm reporting and finding in my interviews with people and experiencing myself. So I think that your voice is really important and I appreciate you um, having me on here. That means so much to me. Thank you so much for saying that. To that end, tell everybody a bit about yourself. What would you like an audience full of single people to know about you as we begin talking? Okay. So um, I'm a magazine writer, uh, primarily for 21 years at Vanity Fair. I am an author of a couple of best-selling books, one called The Bling Ring. And that was also uh, a story I wrote for Vanity Fair that that book was based on was also the basis for a movie made by Sofia Coppola in 2013. I also wrote a book in 2016 called American Girls, Social Media, and the Secret Lives of Teenagers, where I interviewed over 200 girls all over the country about their experience on social media platforms, especially involving um, the ways in which they were being, uh, I would say, abused by uh, cyber bullies and, and uh, you know, sexist culture online. Mm-hmm. Um about the objectification they were experiencing and being asked for nudes and all that. I, there were, nobody was really talking about that. And I, and I thought it was so important for them to give that a voice. So I did that. Um, also, I made a documentary film in 2018 uh, for HBO called Swiped, hooking up in the digital age about online dating. And I uh, it was a really critique of the online dating industry through talking to experts and uh some, you know, people that I interviewed, young people all over the country as well. So um, I live in New York City. I have a daughter who's 20 years old. Uh, she's a college student now in New York, and she lives with me. We live in this apartment in the East Village that is, um, you know, kind of small and cozy and has 3,000 books in it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you, if you put together my books and her books, we we are really close we watch a lot of movies and I raised her as a single, you know, we do, we hang out, we watch movies and we pause the movie and talk about like all the sexist stuff in the movie and uh, <laughs> then start it up again, which we're doing more and more because now, you know, we're having this, everybody's having this revisiting where we're looking back on things and saying, Oh my God, can you believe that they did that, that they got away with that? So we're doing a lot of that. Um, we, until recently, you know, we'd been d- together like every single day for almost a year because of the pandemic. Um, I raised her as a single mom. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm single myself. I've been single for most of my life, except I'm 56. I don't know if I already said that, except for two brief marriages and several, you know, years long relationships, all of which ended in disaster. <laughs> and just like, wow. Yeah. So, um, and I don't, I don't, I want to say this because I think it's important to the discussion that we're about to have. I don't want to upset anybody or trigger anybody. And, and, and I don't want uh, anybody to feel uncomfortable with what I'm about to say. But I think in the Me Too moment, it's so important for women to say these things. I'm also a woman who's, you know, wow, I can't believe I'm getting emotional. That's all right. 
You're among friends, I can assure you of that much. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect to uh, feel this way about saying this. Well, I'm a woman who's been raped. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I haven't ever talked about that in my life until this recent book that I am bringing out called Nothing Personal, um, My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno. I was not raped on a dating app date. I was sexually assaulted on a couple of them in various ways. But I think it's, it's so important for us to talk about this. And, and for us, this is why the Me Too moment has been so significant in my life. Um, I am a white woman who was, you know, raised in privilege. My parents were not rich, but we were comfortable monetarily. And I had, I got a very good education. I'm very lucky in that way. And yet from the time I was very young, you know, these, 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 despite privilege, these things happen to women and girls and other people as well. And they happened to me. I, from the time I was very young, I was, these things were happening to me. I was, uh, you know, cat called and groped and uh, in and out of schools. And I was, I was sexually assaulted and then raped at 14. So I think this, <laughs> and it wasn't until I wrote this book that I'm bringing out that I really understood because it's a memoir and I, I delved into my personal experience that I really understood that this really has been what has been driving a lot of the subject matter that I've dealt with for the last 10 years and especially, um, you know, American girls as well, because I don't want this to happen to other people, you know, mm-hmm. and it happens to almost every woman and girl I've ever known or interviewed something like this. And so, um, so that's, that's really who I am. I have red hair <laughs> and, and uh, that's, I guess, a significant thing because uh, I have big, red hair and that's me and I'm kind of a kind of an East Village chick I hang out a lot in a in a in a bar called Saki Bar Satsuko my best friend owns it and I always like to give her ups because it's one of my favorite places and I also write about it a lot in the book because it's where I would go when I was on dating apps to talk to people about what was going on you know and this was 2014 when I started when they really started to get gain popularity. And I would go in there, like my daughter was at home, you know, she's 14. So I didn't have to stay and like watch her to make sure she was okay. Mm -hmm. I'd go over and I'd say, what the hell, what's this, what the hell with these dating apps? And we'd all just start talking in there. And a lot of those really interesting, I thought, and and sometimes very funny conversations are in, in this new book as well. I'm really looking forward to this new book, nothing personal, my secret life in the dating app Inferno. What's how did this book come to be? Like, why does this book exist and who needs to read it? Why it exists is I never thought to write a memoir. You know, I, I'm, I don't know if you all know my work, if you read my work uh, in Vanity Fair and also my books, when I go into like, I don't even, I can't even explain it. But when I sit down to write this, this, this writer self of me, who's, very distanced in a way from what's going on. I'm an observer and I like to let people talk and I like to hear what they have to say. A lot of times my magazine stories read almost like little mini screenplays or something. There's a lot of dialogue. They're very dialogue driven. I like to hear people say what they say in the way that they say it, which is why when I, when I do interview people, I never give out my transcripts to a a transcriber. I always transcribe them myself because I like to get all the nuances of what they say. Um, so I'm interested in others and then I'm an observer and I, I write in this way. I, in the past, I've always written in this way that that is almost like I've tried to make it almost like you're watching a film. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never really thought I would do a memoir, but then I did a film, you know, swiped, hooking up in the digital age. And after it came out, I started to get emails and DMs from a lot of young people, men and women, but especially women. And they were telling me um, about things that were, and I think are in some weird way, still taboo to talk about. Even though we wanna think that we're so open in these days, people don't talk about the sexual assaults or the rapes or the, these horrible, horrible things that do happen on dating apps. And, and, and 
you know, there, there's a big problem with that on these apps. Mm -hmm. And very little has been said about it. So I wanted to talk about that more, even though I did in the film, I wanted to say, and not just that, it was also the harassing messages and the dick pics and, you know, all these things. And also the, the kind of sadness of just not finding somebody, to, wanting love, wanting a relationship, wanting to be with somebody, and just, it just feeling impossible in this new dating landscape. Where, where do I go? How do I find this person if I'm not on an app? And, you know, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to address that by talking about my own experience. And, you know, I kept telling these young women, don't take this in, don't let it hurt you, don't let it hurt you. But then I realized I'd also been so hurt by it myself. And I, I couldn't really ask them not to feel something that I was feeling myself, mm -hmm. you know, I, and so I felt I had more to share about my own experience as someone who's been through this and dated for more than 40 years. I mean, yeah, I started dating in the 1970s and, you know, nothing was ever perfect. There was always, there was always misogyny. There's, we've always lived in patriarchy. These things are not, uh, it, it's not like things have you know, I have no, I have no illusions. I, I do not look at the past through rose colored glasses. I have no illusions about what went on in those days. And yet I think today is worse. I really do. And, and the mainstream media was not reflecting that has not been reflecting that has not been really going into the ways in which dating, which is so important. It's not some trivial subject. It's, it's, uh, um, the search for love is and 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 lasting connection with others is is one of the main things that makes us human. So um, I wanted to talk about this and tell people, especially young women, from my experience as an older person, it's not you. It's the system. It's this. It's this. It's it's the corporate takeover of dating. And I know this because I've been through it all. At all <laughs> and I, I mean marriages divorces the other bad things I just mentioned that I don't you know need to go on and on about and and just I I'm here to tell you that this is not okay this is not okay how we're being treated as women it was never okay and uh it's got to change I agree wholeheartedly as someone who used dating apps for a full decade wow. um, I can confirm that we are not addressing what happens to women on dating apps. I personally believe that a dating app membership should come with a therapist and it doesn't. We're just sort of like the only advice that I've ever heard given to women in order to take care of their mental health with dating apps is take a break. Just take a break. It's like we're dating apps are this toy that is relatively new in human history and we're literally learning the consequences of it while we go along. And I don't like the consequences of it. So I chose to leave the dating app space two years ago and they've been the best two years of my life. And then I saw that you had created nothing personal and I got very excited because we do have to talk about this stuff. We really, really do. Um, because I think one of the things we forget with dating apps is that it's private. It's happening when you're sitting on your couch swiping and nobody can see that this is going on and no one can see all of these micro traumas or trauma traumas that are happening to you as a result of using dating apps. And what is the mm. impetus for using dating apps in the first place? It's to find love and companionship and partnership. It's not to, it's not to expose yourself to everything that the dating apps allow women to be exposed to. So for you to be telling- And do this, nothing to protect right. you from. Right. And once- something, God forbid, does happen, do nothing to address. Yep. I don't think a block button is enough because the only time you use the block button is after something shitty happens to you, not before. And I don't like that timeline because it's not just once. It's not just one asshole on a dating app. It's hundreds, it's thousands. And I'm just, I mean, I'm not there anymore. I'm not there anymore. And I'm a huge advocate for deleting dating apps altogether, but there are so many people that are still there. So stories like yours are important. And this book like yours is important. And I'm so excited to chat with you. And I want to get into some of the, um, just some of the stuff that I've been dying to talk to you about for lack of a better way to put it. I would like to know, how do you define big dating? Well, it's like big pharma, you know, dating apps are corporations. This is capitalism. My book is a corporate critique as well as a memoir, and it's a critique of a capitalistic takeover of the most intimate area of our lives. 
So these are companies that own the dating sites and the dating apps that we use every day. Some of them are conglomerates like Match Group, which owns some of the biggest sites like Match, Tinder, OkCupid, Hinge. And their primary aim and goal is to make money through charging you fees or taking your time and your money and your data, which until very, very recently, they denied that they were even doing. Now it's been exposed that they are. Only as of last year was there definitive like proof that they're taking our data. Um, most of them are designed in this very sexist bro culture of the tech world, um, you know, which Emily Chang wrote about in her great book, Brotopia. I mean, it's, it's not original with me to say that tech culture is sexist. I mean, just look at the, the statistics about women who are hired and, and what, what roles they have and, and all of the lawsuits that have gone on. And, you know, it's, um, so we're, if, if you're a straight woman, you're, you're, and, and I'm speaking, I'm saying that because I am a straight woman and I, I only know about the experience of people who are not straight through interviewing them. So I don't want to assume that I can speak for them. That's why I keep mentioning straight because I do in the book talk and, and nothing personal. I do. And also in my film swiped, I do include the experience of people who are in the LGBTQ community and there's a trans person interviewed in the film. And I, I also, um, have these interview uh, interviews in my book, my new book as well. So when I say straight woman, I just, I just want to tell you that I understand. I, I want you to understand in, in what way that I'm saying that mm -hmm. um, not, not to give it, not to give it predominance over other experience, but to acknowledge the fact that that is my experience. And that is the framework from which I, I am saying all this. So, um, I mean, on top of being a reporter who has talked to people, outside of my experience. So, um, you know, so if you're a straight woman, you're coming to these platforms and they're designed by, by, by tech bros. And they're supposed to lead you to um, some wonderful dating experience, but the whole, you know, from the jump, there's, there's problems of design, you know, big dating um, would, would have us believe that uh, seeing a woman's face for a nanosecond is enough for a man, a guy, to decide yes or no. And this this really makes us think about hot or not, you know, mm -hmm. um, the whole problem of the hot or not culture of the internet, which, you know, has been the case for decades. That hot or not was sort of the Rosetta Stone. Then you have Mark Zuckerberg at uh, Harvard creating Face Mash, the precursor to Facebook, where, you know, it was a, to, a site to rate women on campus. So these are essentially rating sites. I don't see them as really very different. And like all big companies in capitalism, the bottom line for big dating is the bottom line. Like Big Pharma, which doesn't necessarily always seem to want to make people well as much as they want to sell people drugs. Mm -hmm. Big dating doesn't necessarily want to find us love or lasting relationships as their marketing falsely promises they will. They want to make money off of us and they don't even care again if people are sexually assaulted in the pursuit of of you know whatever they're looking for on these apps they do nothing about it I think, so oh sorry go ahead oh no 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 and if you if you read the book you'll see i i do interview some of the heads of these dating app companies and uh in particular i had a long interview for the film and it's in the book too and in, in, in a more extensive way with mandy ginsburg who was the then CEO of the, of Match Group, and she really had nothing to offer us as women for how they intended to to help us. Y you know, if if anything untoward happened to us on these apps, she said, "Well, you know, um, they're just a reflection of life. Whatever happens on the app happens in life too." But that's just that's what they say, and that's just absolutely not true. The app is not life; it's it's created by people and it's a framework in which you wouldn't necessarily otherwise find yourself. So it's not life. You know, she says, well, it's just like, going, this is what they say. And she said to me, it's just like going into a bar and talking to someone in a bar. No, it's not. It's, it's not at all like going into a bar. It would be like going into a bar if there was a gatekeeper, you know, aside the algorithm, if there was a gate keeper at the bar who said, you can talk to this person, not that person. You talk to that person, not that person. Go over here, go over there. 
and um, also directed you, well, this is also the problem of racism on dating apps, directed you to people who they thought you might most like to want to date based on who you had been all already selecting, you know, in terms of race and uh, who they thought that you were, um, you know, able to talk to because you were good looking enough because there's also a way in which they pre-select whoever is of the same who's ever been matched on more you know gets Mm -hmm. more matches they have those people talk to each other so there's also this weird you know lookist thing going on there's so much that's reiterating to us at every turn that the very last thing a dating app wants you to do is delete it they want you to be stuck there forever that's their only interest Mm -hmm. and the sooner single women understand that dating apps are not on our team, the better. Right. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, yes. There is, um, there's this theory that I've had in my brain and I never like have the research to back up the things that I anecdotally believe through experience, just because I'm not a researcher or a scientist, but I love researchers and scientists very much. I've always been of the opinion that if you put that many millions of people in the same place even a broken clock is right twice a day. Yeah, some people are going to meet each other and some people are going to fall in love. But in the uh, materials that I received for your book, there is a quote that I want to read verbatim. Uh, It says, according to a 2020 study by the Pew Research Center, only 12% of Americans have found committed relationships or marriages through these platforms. And yet... With an estimated 40 million U.S. adults already online dating, the popularity of these apps only continues to grow, notably accelerated during a global pandemic. There's another stat that I didn't grab a quote from, but it it uh, it let us know what percentage of that same cohort had experienced harassment in some capacity on a dating app, and it was 60%. So 12% are finding committed relationships and 60% are finding harassment. And my question for you is, why do you think we keep using dating apps anyway? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to answer your question in a second. But first, I want to say about that, about that statistic. It is, that is a correct statistic. Um, That was from the, I guess you got that from the uh, publicity material that they did for the book. They didn't, you know, the the publicist, uh, that's a true statistic. 12% of Americans, says Pew. That Pew also said 39% of regular dating app users find, you know, a relationship or marriage. So that's not a, so, okay. So first of all, even if it's 39%, for those who use them a lot of the time, 39% is just not a very good percentage either, whether it's 12 or 39, it's not right. great, not great numbers. Like if, if you got the vaccine for COVID and they said, well, it's going to be 39% effective, would you be really confident that you wouldn't get COVID. I mean, God forbid. So (laughs) it's not a good number. Also, that number isn't marriage, right? It's just maybe some relationship or marriage. So the the relationship could be one that lasted. We don't know the the data doesn't say in this particular study, did it last a year or two years or a week or a month? We don't know. So, but still, okay, just agreeing with you, the numbers are not great, but I just wanted to be, you know, sure that we were being accurate and reporting what these numbers really were and of how they're course. still, and how they're still not great. So why do you think we keep using dating apps anyway? You ask, well, we keep using them because we're addicted to them because the design is to be addictive. I go on, I went into this and, and swiped my film, you know, which you can see on HBO, it's still up there. Or Amazon Prime for a few bucks, I do, which I do not get anything, but um, you you can see it on those platforms still. And I talk about the addiction part, and I know the exact time code when I do because somebody just asked me for it. Is writing about my book? It's at like like about twenty five minutes in. There's I think a really great interview with Adam Alter who wrote Irresistible. He's a, a, a social scientist at NYU, and he talks about um, I was interviewed this for, for about this a lot, by the way, for swipe, but I'll just say it again. Cause it's so, it's so striking. Yeah. Um, there was this, uh, study done by this really controversial psychologist who's now passed away named BF Skinner. 
about pigeons and how you would get pigeons to get addicted and, and to stuff. And essentially Skinner said he turned them into gamblers because he gave them food pellets. They had to peck to get a food pellet when they didn't know when they would get the food, but if they just got the food pellet, every time they pecked, they got kind of bored and weren't interested in this essentially game. But when they didn't know when they were going to get the food pellet, they just kept pecking and pecking and pecking. And then they would get the food pellet and they just kept pecking and pecking because it was just fun for pigeons to play this game. It's called gamification. It's what, you know, it's, it's a, a tech thing and it's what, um, it's what dating app companies have done to dating. They've, Turn them turn it into games. Very early on, Sean Rad, the uh, one of the founders of, of Tinder, um, talked very proudly about how yeah we turned dating into a game, and there were all these media uh, reports about wow these these you know Wonder Boys at Tinder look at all this money they're making. They turned dating into a game, um, but dating isn't a game. I mean that doesn't mean it can't be fun. Like I I've always thought you know one of the whole points of it is to have fun, have a good time, talk to somebody, get to know somebody, you know, it's certainly not fun to be on Tinder at all. <laughs> so I don't know, like, I think they took all dating apps, took all the fun out of it kind of, because it feels exhausting. You're just like that pigeon. You're just packing and packing and packing and packing. And you get this little dopamine rush when, and Jonathan Bedeen, who invented the swipe talks about this again, very proudly in my film that, you know, yeah, it's kind of like a slot machine, he says, and you get that rush, you know, and people that I interviewed for the film also talk about, yeah, it's weird. You get this rush like, oh, it's a match. It's a match, you know, <laughs> and you see this screen pop up and it's like, woo, 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 you know, it's like bells and whistles. And so you're not really, you're not really connecting with anybody anymore. You're in Las Vegas at the slot machine. So um, that's why I think people keep using them. Because it's it's the and I go into this in more um, at, at more length in this new book about how it's social conditioning, it's behavior modification. You don't maybe think that you're a person who would be susceptible to this, but guess what? All people are. When I, everyone is, if you have a brain, you are because they've they've um, you know they're rewiring the pathways in our brain. And what started to scare me when I was on dating apps in 2014, I started, I was on them for a couple of years there back then, 2014, 15, I would go off, you know, you delete, you go back on, you delete, you go back on for a few years. I was really shocked one morning to wake up and reach for my phone to look at, I think it was OkCupid or Tinder and think to myself, oh my God, they've done something to my brain. This is something that's been done to my brain. Because this is the first thing I think of when I open my eyes is going and looking at, did I get any matches? Did that person answer my DM or did, did he, did he DM me? You know, you just, you just want to see how many matches do I have? How many, what are the numbers now? You know, so many people that I interviewed about dating apps will actually say, well, I have 900 matches or I have Actually, these guys in a bar in Vermont were like, I have 40 matches. <laughs> well, that's not really very many, but there's not a lot of people in Vermont. So I, I just, you know, people, but what I'm saying is people will actually brag about this number because that's what the whole, you know, social media world and the internet has done to us. It's made, it's quantified experiences so that they're, you know, we have this quantitative sort of signs of how good or bad they are. You know, and that's not, that's not a great way to um, find, find love or commitment or connection. It's, it's, and it makes you feel bad too, because if you're not getting good numbers, you know, I got, I got a lot of emails too, during all this work, articles, film stuff that I, I've done from really, I guess, men that you could really describe as incels, very, very angry very, very angry incel men. You know, those are the self-described involuntary celibate men who are very angry uh, about the fact that nobody wants to date them. Of course, they don't really ascribe this to being, you know, having bad personalities perhaps or <laughs> being undateable. No, it's all about, um, you know, it's all about women. Women are just, are just uh, you know, I don't want to repeat their ideas about women. Yeah. 
I don't want to say what they think, but you can imagine what they think. And mm. and they are are a significant presence on the internet and in the what's called manosphere. I just re- read recently. There's this wonderful book by Laura Bates, who's the great young UK feminist. She has a new book out called Men Who Hate Women, and she really delved into this whole thing. She went undercover and the incel world, and saw how they were, you know, pre- really there's a lot of predation on young young guys, boys to turn them into incels really this is and they've become really um scary in the sense that they're now you know involved in domestic terrorism and killing people and killing women um elliot rogers their patron saint he's the mass shooter from 2014 so anyway um they are angry they tell me they they've told me because um women won't have sex with them and they see dating apps as this uh, thing that is supposed to give you get you sex, right? And they're angry because they don't. Even though this is this tool that's supposed to get you sex, they still don't get it, and they're so angry about that, right? So, what, whatever you think about, you know, uh, the significance of incels in our culture, our country right now. What was striking to me was when I was on dating apps is that. A lot of guys who, you know, who I even went on dates with, talked to, went on dates with, who really didn't seem like incels and did not describe themselves as incels, incels thought that too. They thought they had the same um, attitudes and the same beliefs as incels that, oh, well, dating apps are just to get you sex. I mean, that's like, it was like a given, like, and that is what Sean Rad and others, say. They, they, they don't say it now because the marketing teams now that you know, it's become such big companies. I, I probably, uh, I'm guessing tell them not to, but these were, these are called hookup apps. This was, they're they're called hookup apps, but hookup apps as tools for men to get sex. That's really what the whole thing was supposed to be. And that is how to this day, I believe a lot of men, whether or not they think of themselves as sexist feminists or whatever, that a lot of men that I've interviewed just see it as that, you know, and that they don't see anything wrong with that. But what's wrong with it is that the sense of entitlement, the, um, you know, the objectification um, can actually create, it's, I think it's exacerbating rape culture. Because if this tool is supposed to get you sex, and then you don't get it, well, that's not fair. That was part of what I thought I was supposed to get here. The UK, um, uh, law enforcement in the UK, the, the equivalent of the, their FBI over there actually did a study where they said, and this is in my book too, that they believe that online dating culture is creating, quote unquote, like a new kind of rapist, a new kind of sexual a person who commits sexual assault, who sees these platforms as as somehow guaranteeing a sexual encounter. I mean, there's so there's so much that I want to say. Like, so why would women, I'm just, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm just I feel like I strayed a, a field and I didn't answer your question, and I and I really kind of was trying to because what I'm trying to say is that you say, well, why do we still use them? Why would we still use them when all of this is going on? That's how powerful the addiction is. I don't know that curing the addiction to dating apps is the right strategy, in my opinion, the strategy for actually making things better for single women is to cure hating singlehood. Because when you love your singlehood, when you don't see it as this fatal flaw, dating apps lose their power to fuck with your life because you don't think that you need to find someone anymore. There are massively competing goals between absolutely everyone that's using dating apps. The dating apps themselves, their goals are money. Men's goals are sex work that they don't have to pay for. And (laughs) women's goals are finding partnership. And this is hugely heteronormative and generalizing. I fully understand that, but it is still happening. And with all of these- And also, I mean, I don't mean to interrupt you again, but also- it's borne out by study after study after study. This is not to say that every woman wants a relationship and every man just wants sex. Of course not. But in so much of the data, even from dating app companies, mm-hmm. it bears out that this is what women in the main are looking for is connection. And, and why is that a bad thing? Like, I think that that's good. Like, I, I think it's good to want to connect with people, whether or not, I think it's good to have relationships with people. I, I, 
I don't see that as a bad thing or anything either. embarrassed or ashamed of. Yeah, I think it's great. I love relationships. I think they're fantastic. I just don't think dating apps are the path to get there. I no. really don't. Well, no, no, they're not. And that's, as we've already talked about, that's, that's borne out by the data that we do have available is that they're not a path towards that, but we're addicted to them. So we're still using them, unfortunately. And I agree with you. What you just said is that there needs to be a radical reimagining of this whole thing. Um, well, I'm, I interrupted you, so I'm going to let you continue saying what you're saying. I'm sorry. No, you said exactly what I wanted to say, which was a radical reimagining is exactly that. That's that's the podcast that you're on is hopefully designed to help single women reframe the way they feel about their own singlehood so that we don't put ourselves in the position of feeling desperate to get out of singlehood and resort to things like dating apps that don't have our best interests at heart, that turn us into people that are addicted to dating apps. The only thing so I was using them for 10 years on and off. And I did the whole like delete, redownload, delete, redownload more times than I can count. And I spent more money with dating apps than I ever want to see the total for. Um, the, the thing that got me to delete them permanently was I finally asked myself, how are dating apps serving me? What are they giving me? I'm giving them all of this energy and time and attention and money and like headspace and mental health. I'm giving them so much. What am I getting back? And I was literally getting less than nothing. Because it wasn't just that I wasn't matching. I wasn't meeting anybody. I wasn't going on dates. I wasn't, you know, getting any sort of positive interaction with people that I wanted to date. I was getting overtly negative stuff that I then had to process and deal with and carry the burden of. And as soon as I could acknowledge that for myself and understand that that shit was so much worse than singlehood itself, I deleted them and I never got them back again. Yeah. um, I talk about in Nothing Personal, this new book, I want to just pick up on something you said there about burden. So there is, I experienced when I was on there, there's this way in which even if it's not sex that the guy is getting from you, right? It's like, he's getting some, you, you're doing more labor, more emotional labor, just like women always do. And we've seen in the pandemic, like it's become so cruelly clear Mm -hmm. that women do more. In, in domestic relationships, you know, they're in, and it's really affecting our health and well-being, our self-esteem, our, you know, we're, we're burdened with, with doing more in relationships. And this is true on these apps as well. A, a young friend of mine calls it being a device wife. I love this phrase, device wow. wife. You should a device wife, like, like Scarlett Johansson in her, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you're this disembodied voice. It's those, I would get these from one guy in particular, I'm thinking of, I would get these texts from him. I had never even met him. I'd never met him, but we hadn't gone on a date yet. But throughout the day, he'd say like, hi, sweetheart. How are you? What are you doing? Oh, I just got, I just got a taco from the taco truck. Um, You know, I just be like, why the fuck are you telling me this? I don't, I'm so busy. I'm a single mom with a job. Like what I, like, you don't even know what to say. and, and why do you even put up with it? Well, I put up with it and I'm not excusing this because it's dumb. I put up with it because I thought he was cute and I wanted to have sex with him. But like getting there was so much work, so much labor where I had to hear his inane, uh, to read his inane text, ding, ding, ding. He just wants to talk to me all the time and tell me this and tell me that. But I realized it's not just, he's not really talking to me. He doesn't talk, he's not really talking to me. He just wants someone there. Mm-hmm. Just wants someone there to listen to him, to acknowledge his existence. And this is the kind of unequal, but I wasn't doing that to him and I never would. I have shit to do. Hello. So, so, and I don't care what he thinks of my taco. So I'm just, (laughs) right. Or my taco truck. So I was just like, you know, sometimes I would just continue on with these things because the reporter in me would want to know like, how far does this go? What exactly is he trying to get here? And I realized I'm, I've never even met this man and I'm already angry at him the way that I'm angry at ex-husbands for, for making me do all the cooking and the cleaning and picking up the kids at school and doing everything that I did in those relationships. And, and it's the same thing. It's just on an app. It's just on text or just on the app. Mm -hmm. It's the amount of just imbalanced bullshit. I, I don't know if you can, I mean, you tell me, I don't know because I've never been married and I've been in very few long-term relationships, but like, is it easier to see this stuff from the outside than it is when you're in it? 
Well, I think that even to this day, unfortunately, women are judged on the, on having, I'm putting like big air quotes, having successful relationships, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, do you, it starts when you're very, very little. Do you have a boyfriend? You know, um, uh, are you married? Why aren't you married? You know, are you dating anyone? Are you seeing anyone? Like we're supposed to, we're, we're meant to think that we're validated somehow by having a quote unquote lasting or long-term relationship. Um, some early women readers of my book have said like, thank you. I'm going to give this to my parents. So they stop asking me why I don't have a husband or, 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 you know, also you might not want one, but uh, it's just, it's just become more and more difficult to, to have a long-term relationship, number one with someone. And I'm not even really sure that any, you, you know, it's funny. You said like, what am I getting out of what am I getting out of these apps? And you deleted them. Well, that's kind of where I was when I was in marriages and some longer term relationships. So what am I getting out of this relationship? I don't, nothing. <laughs> it's, you're draining me. I'm going to delete this relationship because it, you know, divorce, moving out, whatever, changing the locks, because it's just, it just becomes untenable. You are asked to give, 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 give and you're not getting back equally. And I'm not saying that's true for every single man. Of course not. There are wonderful men. There are great men. They're, you know, my book, my book, Nothing Personal is dedicated to a man, Donald Suggs Jr. If you don't know who he is, um, he was a, a great journalist for the Village Voice. He's unfortunately passed away. He was my best friend and he was a big feminist, gay rights activist, and so I love men, like Cher says, you know, I love men. You just don't need them to live. Right. But you're, you're led to think that you are. And you're led to think that people will think you're um, uh, a more successful woman if you have one. And it took, and so I was conditioned in all those ways. I was born in 1964. You know, I, I mean, I grew up with, uh, my mother was a 50s housewife mm-hmm. until until she I uh, left my dad for a man 10 years younger who owned a, a hippie owned a health food restaurant, <laughs> which, you know, sent us all in a really different and very interesting direction, which I also talk about in the book. And um, yeah, it was a really cool place called The Spiral and it was in Miami, Florida. And it was just full of really, it was like a center of hippie culture in Miami in the 1970s. And it was really a fun place in a lot of ways. And you would think like, wow, that's got to be safe for a young girl growing up, right? Because you're among all these like lefty hippie people. Well, no, it was in the spiral restaurant and my parents were not, this was not their fault really. And they didn't even know what was happening because I was too embarrassed to say, it was in the spiral restaurant that I was, as soon as I hit puberty, I was like continually groped, attacked in the dish room. I I was being the bus girl and I went back there with some dishes to put them down you know my hands were full of the bus tray and the dishwasher who was this like 30 something guy um grabbed me and and you know Mm -hmm. tried to do stuff so I I got away but I'm just saying like um why did I go off on that big old tangent because this is where we go (laughs) right oh but like oh so being married what's being married like I hated being married so much and it Again, you know, there are great men, but I I never was in a relationship with one who treated me as an equal. I was in relationships with men who um, I think were jealous of me. And I didn't realize it at the time, you know? I didn't realize it. I, I just thought I must be doing something wrong or what is he so angry about her? But as I advanced in my career and got, you know, better at doing things. And especially when I started to get some attention, there was a lot of emotional and personal retribution that took a variety of forms. I was just telling you, you know, before I went to the Alice Neal show, you know, Alice Neal is at the Met. Now she's got this big, there's this big show of Alice Neal. If you look at it, go to it, see it online. Alice Neal was one of the greatest portrait painters of the 20th century. And she's just now really finally getting her due that she deserves And uh, early on, I didn't know this about her, but early on in her career, a man that she was involved with burned her paintings. Unreal. Burned them and all of her papers as well. Can you imagine trying to come back from that? You know, I'm not Alice Neal. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that I did. I think that it's representative of of a lot of women in 
and marriages and long-term relationships go through. And I actually talked this about this in the book. I, I saw a tweet from a young woman who said like, you know, it's taboo for us in, you know, in our, we, we who are trying to, you know, make it in our careers to talk about, but guys don't like it when we succeed. And, and we have partners who try and undermine us. And, and so that was unfortunately my experience. Um, and I had to get out, I had to delete that relationship, get mm-hmm. away. I, I would not have done the things that I've done in my life on top of being a single mom if I hadn't been single. I know that because one of the worst years of my career was when I was married to a certain man. I had no bylines that year. Every year since I'm like 28, I have some bylines. I'm doing things. I'm writing articles. I'm doing a book. I'm doing the film. I'm doing whatever. The year that I was married to this particular man, uh, I had no bylines because it wasn't that I wasn't trying to work and, and support us both and our kids. He had a kid too. I was the main source of income, which he resented, I think. But um, I, it was it was really tough because if you're in a house, I, I love men, put it this way. I love men. I just don't want one in my house. Yeah. I mean, that's what be Goldberg's like greatest quote is that she doesn't want a man in her house. And I, I feel that I also feel like sometimes breakups are the best thing that can happen to a woman. And we don't talk about them that way. Like when singlehood is not worse than a shitty relationship. And I don't think oh, it's we so much about better, enough, right? It's, it's so, so much. much better. Oh I, my God. It's so much better. I could not ever be married again. Me personally. I know it works for some people. I don't know if you get, if this podcast is the type where you'll get letters from people. Cause I do sometimes when I say something or tweet something, I'll say, look at my man. He's the best. He does everything. I love him. He's perfect. You know, we, we, we see all that in the media and the news and we know that there are men like that. Okay, fine. But for a lot of us, uh, being married is not great. And I don't recommend it, especially, personally, I don't. Especially if you're a woman who is in the arts, who wants to write, who needs to create things, who needs time and space to think, to be alone, to, to absorb the world, you know, all that stuff that goes on. I just, it was so, in, there was such interference from the men in my life. I love being single. Can I just tell you? I love yes, it. You can say that on this podcast. It is encouraged. Okay. I love being <laughs> single. I love being single. I love the independence. I love the freedom. I love the ability to make my own way to just, you know, if I have nothing else to do, plop down and read a book and don't have anyone uh, make me feel guilty for that or do whatever I want to do, you know? And I love also single motherhood. And that's something that I talk about it in this book as well. I love being a single mom. I know single motherhood gets such a bad rap. Um, it's so vilified. It's so looked upon, especially, you know, it comes from the right wing a lot. As like the Ann Coulter said in her book, Guilty, it's the single mothers are the source of everything bad in America. I mean, this is just ridiculous. It's threatening to people that single motherhood could actually be something that you enjoy and love. Why? Because it means you don't need a man in your life. You don't need one. That patriarchal idea that you must have a man to raise a child and all children need fathers. No, not true. Children need love. They need good parenting, whether from women, men, or people who identify in other ways. They do not need a father. They need people who love them and, and take care of them in, in positive and, and uh, responsible ways. And I just... It was just the best experience of my life, single motherhood, more than anything I've ever done in my life. I loved raising a child on my own. No, it's not for everybody to have a child. And I'm not saying that everybody should do it or that's the path for everyone. I'm not like saying, oh, this is how you fix your loneliness. Go out and have a kid. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if that is something you choose, don't be scared. It, it, it's, it can be really wonderful. Absolutely. I had a single mom. Plenty of people have single moms. Plenty of people who listen to this podcast are single moms or are, you know, planning to be single moms. It's not, it's not the bad thing that uh, outdated narratives would tell us that it is. Yeah. Um, And I don't want to, I don't want to like overstate the, I don't want to look at it through rose colored glasses either. What's challenging about it is financially. We live in a country that doesn't support mothers and children, period, of any 
uh, living situation. Mm -hmm. We need, uh, we need what Elizabeth Warren has been talking about and we need, uh, you know, and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris. We need, we need a a lot of things to change. And I hope this can happen in this new administration. What do we need? We need universal health care. We need universal preschool. We need day, we need daycare, affordable daycare or, or state sponsored daycare, which they have in other countries. And, and it makes children safer and happier. It makes mothers safer and happier. And it makes the whole experience of having families um, so much better. It's really cruel. It's really, this, the policies that affect mothers and children in this country are just very cruel and they need to change. I couldn't agree with you more. I tend to think that like, there's something about a happy, independent woman that really scares and upsets people. And therefore those aren't people who are supported or, um, you know, in any capacity by society because there's something scary about us. So they want to discourage us from being just that. Um, so you kind of have to fight against that and it isn't fair, but it is possible, I guess, is what I would say to that. Um, before I let you go, I have one question for you. Okay. What, what is the greatest lesson that you learned from dating apps? Well, when you say greatest lesson, it sounds like it needs to be something positive or good. So I'll, I'll start with the good because there, there are, there are some good things and there were some good things. And then I'll move on to some lessons I learned that were, were more difficult. Um, I would say the greatest lesson or, or thing that I learned, um, you know, because as you'll read in the book, one of one of the really nice reviews from from Kirkus says this is a real like really a love story. So, I did fall in love with someone I met on an app, and I I like you said like a, a even a even a broken clock is right twice a day. You know, <laughs> like it does happen. That now that doesn't mean that the app is good, and that doesn't mean that the relationship was good in a long term way. But I did fall in love with someone, and. Um, one of the things I loved about him was how he was much younger than I am. All the guys that I dated because there were, weren't people my age on the apps in those days were, were much younger. He was, uh, well, he was 23 when I met him and I was 49, mm-hmm. but we, we saw each other for four or five years off and on. And one of the things I learned, I was going through menopause while this was all happening and it was affecting my body in a lot of ways. You know, I got this skunk streak in my hair all of a sudden and, and, and I gained a lot of weight, which you don't have to do in menopause. That just happened to me because I wasn't prepared for things that were going on. And I, I sort of denied what was happening to me for a long time. I said, Ooh, what, what is this? Why don't my pants fit? You know, and you're, you're going, you're going through all this stuff and it's, it's so taboo to talk about. And that's unfortunate because any, we're, we're all going to go through it, you know? And it was really through him that, I learned how to accept my changing body and my changing self. And I, I don't want to say, oh, this man taught me how to love myself. It's not really that. Through having sex with him and through having a relationship with him, and he didn't care. He didn't, he didn't care that I gained weight. He didn't care that my hair was going white. He, he liked me the way I was. And I should have known that already. I should have, but the social conditioning is so powerful and it's so hard on us. And I learned through him and through, through knowing him and relating to him that I was still desirable. I was still, um, I could still have great sex. I could still, I could still do all the things I did. I'm just older and, and, um, a lot wiser. And, and I know that I don't want to sound arrogant, but that is one of the trade-offs, right? You do, you do get wiser. You do. I mean, if, if you don't learn from your life, then, then like you're an idiot, like you, you haven't been paying attention. Right. And, and you're, I, I don't want to say idiot. I mean, that's mean, but you, you're not anybody who, well, that's why we say wise old woman, you know, in yeah. a lot of, in a lot of cultures, older women become, you know, witches and shamans. And I certainly look like a witch these days. No, I'm just kidding. But I know I do. I do feel like I'm moving into this witchy poo kind of period where I feel very magical and powerful because of my age, because of my age. And I think that, um, 
that had to do with this particular relationship. Now, I'm not going to, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to go into all the other ways that it was disturbing and upsetting <laughs> and, and it wasn't good. And uh, yeah, and that, that all has to do with dating app culture, maybe even more than that young man himself, because he was being inculcated into all this kind of toxic masculinity through, through this, this culture. Mm-hmm. But that was, that was something I learned that, that made me, that made me feel good. But, you know, on the other hand, what did you learn on dating apps? I learned that, you know, I pardon the expression, but I have to say it. And I do talk about it in the book. I learned that millennial men are really sexist. You would think that. <laughs> You would think that, you know, we'd be on a forward progression, but no. And there are studies that bear this out that millennial men may even be more sexist in a, in a way than their fathers. And I really think this has everything to do with the internet and dating apps. And if you want to, if you want to find out more about that, I won't go into it all here because we've sort of covered a lot of ground out that you can hear about it in the book. And they need to, and they will. And I will, of course, uh, link to the book in the show notes. I will link to all of your work in the show notes. Um, is there you. anything else that you would like them to know about the book apart from the fact that I'm going to remind them to buy it about 15 times? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I have a website, just my name, nancyjosales.com, and I have a, a new page for the book and you can see the reviews that have come out on there. You can see the blurbs that I've gotten, including from the amazing Tyra Banks. Now, can I just tell a story about that? So Tyra. Oh my God, please. I did. Like my friend was like looking at my new website. She's like, how'd you get a blurb from Tyra? I'll tell you how, because Tyra is a woman's woman and (laughs) and she's wonderful. So I, I, you know, when you, when you have a book coming out, your publisher is kind of suggesting that you need to get prominent people to get you blurbs but I don't really know a lot of people like that like I, I I have interviewed them oh my god some very very famous people over the years you know um the most famous people that there have uh, are in entertainment over the years but I don't really get to know them I don't hang out with them you know I I'm I'm like I said I'm here in the east village with my kid and I'm not I'm not fancy like that. Like I don't go to the events and everything. I never, I've been at Vanity Fair for 21 years. I've never been to the Oscar party. Even when Bling Ring came out, I just, I don't have the right dress. I really just don't. And I don't have the money to buy it. And I don't miss all that stuff. So anyway, I don't know famous people. So my publisher wants me to get famous people for blurbs. And I look through my, I look through my contacts and stuff. And I'm like, I I don't know anybody, but then you start to cultivate, you're like, well, this person, that person. And so I did this story on Tyra in a a long time ago, maybe 2006 or seven. And it was really like, I teased her a lot. The the first line of the piece is I'm very gassy, says Tyra. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. But it was, I think about also about how she's this sort of incredibly interesting person. And, and anyway, she liked it. She sent me flowers. I was like, wow, I remembered those flowers. And so I, I just hit her up. I just hit her up and I said, hey, Tyra, remember me? Could you do, could I send you a book? Could you blurb it? And she's like, of course, what do you mean? Because she's just, she's just great. I That's love, so and sweet. so I cannot wait to get some Smize Cream. You know, she has a new ice cream called Smize Cream. <gasps> and, <laughs> you know, Smize so did you know Smize is in the dictionary now? Oh, thank goodness. Yes. Smize. Well, my brother who's an art director told me he's like, he's like, that's what I tell people all the time when they're getting shot for the the the, the magazine they work for. They they got a smize. So Tyra's amazing. You can see Tyra's blurb, but all, the other thing you can see on my website is you can see um I've never done this before. I did a Spotify playlist for the book because in the book I mentioned so much of my romantic life in my mind and my is is connected to songs. And I mention a lot of them in the book. So it's it's songs of my romance. I have a Spotify playlist. It's sort of like songs of my romantic coming of age and life and divorce. It's like 40 years of songs that are connected to this book and to my romantic life. And finally, um, there's a link to videos because I, I only have one up there so far, but I'm going conti- to continue to be interested in how dating apps are affecting our culture and especially women and yeah. girls. So I'm going to keep on doing uh, video interviews about how this all is evolving in Corona and everything and put it up there. So you can see all that there. 
And I will send this audience there. And uh, on behalf of this audience, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, for your insight into a space that is affecting so many of us in so many different ways. Um, I cannot thank you enough. And, and I know my audience joins me in that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. 